Hello, everybody. Welcome to the session on Design Principles 101, Top Figure Making Tips to Boost Science Communication. Um, let's see, just wanna make sure that all of our technologies are okay. Looks like I'm able to live share my screen. All right, so what I'm gonna do is basically share my entire browser here. And let's see, hopefully you can see my screen. All right, super excited to get started here. Um, if you're just joining, again, this session will be on Design Principles 101, Top Figure Making Tips to Boost Science Communication. Um, let's see, just wanna make sure my audio and video is okay. If at any point uh, my audio cuts out or you can't hear me or see me or my screen, do let me know um, in the chats. I believe you're able to ask questions in the Q&A box there on the sort of workshop homepage. So um, don't hesitate to shout out there if, if you have questions as well. Great. And the AAAS uh, staff has been extremely helpful in getting me set up today. So, all right, let's get started. Welcome everybody. Um, what we'll cover today, or I guess in the next 40 minutes, we've got uh, not a lot of time together. We have a lot of content to go through. I'll go through a little uh, quick intro about myself and what I do. Um, we're gonna dive into some top tips for creating better science figures. And we'll do it sort of interwoven with a few figure makeovers live. I know that uh, you all sort of learn from seeing and doing as opposed to just me speaking at you for tips. So hopefully we'll put some of those theoretical tips uh, into practice. And just a bit of a, uh, a heads up, I am gonna focus quite a bit heavily on the biosciences. So specifically uh, immunology, maybe cancer biology examples, uh, cell bio, and um, the tips that I'll be covering will be relevant regardless of the scientific uh, subfield that you might study or research. Uh, the design tips will be sort of agnostic to those, but I am going to use those specific scientific uh, areas. So just FYI, I might lean heavier on those. So if your background is in chemistry or agriculture or um, you know policy, whatever it is, um, you can still take these design principles and apply it to your work. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, my name is Shiz. I'm one of the co-founders of an app called BioRender. Hopefully some of you have heard it before. Maybe some of you have not. We're relatively new, um, but my um, past life, I was, I guess I still am, a medical illustrator. I uh, did my training at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. There's about four to six students a year that matriculate, so it's a pretty small program. Um, and then worked at National Geographic Magazine. I actually lived in DC, as many of you may, or at least where AAAS is headquartered, um, and then moved back to Toronto to start a studio and now BioRender. So my background I think is in about 12, 15 years in the making in medical illustration. And now the focus is really democratizing science communication for the non-artist. And I uh, had, had to really switch my thinking from working and setting at Hopkins, you know, very highly technical audience, and then going to Nat Geo, which was an audience of a huge demographic. So, you know, children all the way up to 90 year olds. Some of you may have grown up looking at National Geographic images and illustrations. Um, but you know, the great common denominator was visuals. And it's always going to be the best and easiest way to consume and communicate information. Um, here's a snapshot of one of the graphics we made at Nat Geo. So a collaboration, of course, of you know, art directors, incredible designers, uh, typographers, medical illustrators. And what we do at BioRender now is actually take all of our learnings from making really complex figures like this. You know, why are they successful? What is it about figures like this that can communicate to a broad range of audiences? Now, you may be only speaking to maybe a narrow range from your day to day, perhaps in a lab meeting or internal presentation, um, but your figures should really be able to communicate to uh, a larger audience, even in today's world of. Uh, mistrust in science, you know, visuals can be the great unifier in understanding scientific concepts. So, you know, let's kind of dig in and apply some of these concepts to our own figures so that they can be better communicated. 
Um, going back to my sort of concentration on uh, immunology and uh, cancer biology, you know, if you Google a concept like MHC2, um, some of you may know that that means if you work in this field, um, you actually get a several several different ways in which it's communicated in the world today. A lot of these images are published, so naturally, you know, it's going to be more and more difficult to consume and understand concepts if there's no commonality between how we're showing things, if they're not properly labeled. Also, if there are no tools out there to even visualize it, for some reason, um, it's been, you know sort of left up to the scientists to be able to create these scientific figures when, you know, as a medical illustrator, I understand how complex it is to illustrate uh, scientific concepts. So hopefully um, we'll go through some tips today that will make it easier for you. Um, and a little bit of a plug here about BioRender specifically, it is an online program for creating high quality science figures designed for non-scientists, or sorry, non-artists specifically scientists and, um, you know, of course, those with no art background or perhaps little art background and usually little to no time. So it's very easy and um, uh, functional to use. And common use cases, really use cases for using better figures in general in your day to day. So all of these listed here and many, many more. So that's BioRender specifically. And as I said, we're shifting as medical illustrators and our team here, um, our goal from making you know, really high-end bespoke graphics to now empowering everybody with the tools and practical knowledge to visually communicate science. So that's my little intro spiel. I'm going to actually dive into BioRender to do a lot of the demo. But like I said, you don't, um, don't really need BioRender specifically. Um, for those that don't know about BioRender, here it is, super easy to use online platform. Um, I'm going to be using our new slides feature. It's not widely available yet, but um, this just helps me interact with all of you so that we can actually get into the nitty gritty of designing something. And again, we'll skew a little heavily towards the bioscientists and making pathways, maybe lab protocols and such, but hopefully you can take away some of these tips um, for your figures. Um, just going back to my homepage here, I wanted to kind of highlight that I'm going to be going through general, I guess, four general concepts when making figures, and also, uh, I guess, concepts that we commonly see mistakes in. So if I were to flip open a journal, and I go to the graphical abstracts, or maybe the publication figures, or I'm attending a, a lecture or a talk, there's always a few things that I always see not done that well as far as figures and how we can improve it. And uh, it just so happens that these are sort of four general categories. I probably had 50 that I wanted to go through today, but the four that I'll go through today are optimizing layout and story flow. Two is color. Color is a huge topic. I could spend hours talking about color, but we'll sort of make it succinct about 10, 15 minutes. Arrows and lines, there is a proper way and place and time to use the right arrow and the li right line. And then decluttering your figure. We get asked this a lot. You know, I have this image that I'm about to publish or present or make into a poster and it looks cluttered and I don't really know how to fix it. And you've already gone all, you know, to, sunk hours into making the figure. There's a couple of things you can do to clean it up um, and salvage those images. Okay. So I'm just gonna peek into the Q and A here. Looks good. All right. The question is, is BioRender open to all to use or is there a cost? There actually is a free version. It's free forever. Um, I think you get, you know, all the basics, including a handful of uh, free illustrations to create. You get all access to all of the BioRender templates. Actually, since you asked, I'll just go through that now. Hopefully you can still see my screen. It's all of our beautiful scientifically vetted uh, templates or like starting points, I guess. They're kind of half-baked figures. So in some cases they're fully baked and all you have to do is go in and um, you know modify the labels and such. But um, it's a robust team of medical illustrators, um, many who have done their PhD and postdoc in that particular field. And then they happen to have a, a knack for design. So they're actually creating these templates with us in-house. So a really great collaboration. I'm just gonna to go to my subfolder here again. Um, so let's get started with layouts and story flow. So this will require me actually to jump into Photoshop. You don't need to know how to use Photoshop, but I'm just gonna use it because um, I wanna be able to draw with my pen and you can see as I go through. 
Um, first step, try to sketch your ideas on paper. I know it sounds childish and elementary or basic. It really is the best way to get your ideas um, out of your brain and onto some 2D surface. Uh, we do it as professionals. There's just no better way to get your ideas out quickly. We would not recommend going, you know, directly to a rendering tool. You could, you know, I guess for the case of via rendering, start with a template and modify it. Um, but I would still recommend, you know, just grabbing the back of an envelope and, you know, just writing down really quickly your main points, the main characters of your story because that will actually hold relatively true to your final figure. When you start adding unnecessary things, that's when you realize you've diverged from your napkin drawing. So think of yourself at a bar with a friend, if you remember those days <laughs> being in person, and then sketching out your research or whatever it is you need to communicate to a friend at a bar, just the basics. That's really um, what you wanna hold on to, even when you're in the final finishing touches of your figure. Um, a few things to keep in mind, though, about sort of style composition and story flow. I'm going to remove these lines. Um, there isn't really a lot of, I guess, creative license when you're thinking about composition in a scientific figure. Maybe for, you know, a painting in an art gallery, it's pretty free reign. But when you're trying to communicate really complex stuff like we do in the sciences, we have to follow some pretty... Uh, try tested and true guidelines. So one of those being um, general composition. So left to right, up to down, we all know that. That's how we read in a book, at least you know in, in most parts of the world. Um, cyclical for you know kind of looping or feedback loops, um, any kind of concept that is you know kind of goes round and around. A Z-shaped formation for content is pretty good for lab protocols or if you're doing a long string of events that don't fit in a long um, row, you can typewriter that back to the beginning and it'll kind of create a Z shape. So basically if you follow your eye, that's the direction it would go. M shape is for generally posters. I mean, we go back to making posters. I think many of you did make posters for the poster session. Um, I, I'd say the fork shape is also a pretty common one. If you're applying for grants, sometimes there's, you know, some sort of um, protocol or experiment that will create two specific aims or outcomes. The fork should always be sort of pointing left to right, up to down. Sometimes we see down to up, right to left, and that can be a little bit disorienting for your audience. So try to follow this general, I guess, inertia or gravitational pull from top left to bottom right. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump into Photoshop really quick. So hopefully you can still see my screen. Um, this is going to mimic what I would do if I was not on camera and I was just writing my ideas <clears throat> on a piece of paper. What I usually do is have a reference image or maybe um, my before figure if you're trying to improve it, or maybe uh, your abstract, you know, just sort of a paragraph of words that might be helpful for you to refer to and then make your figure from. Um, sometimes you can also add in, um, you know, other elements, other important information. So I'm going to actually stick in here our, our little rules or cheat sheet of, of good composition. Okay, so I'm using um, my Wacom tablet. It's just one of these. They're actually really inexpensive nowadays. I think I bought this for 100, 150 bucks. I mean, they used to be three, four, five hundred dollars. There are Cintiqs that you can actually see the screen as you're drawing. Those are sort of in the thousands. Um, but these ones, I think there's also versions of these that are, are pretty cheap. It's cordless now, too. I used to have to, I know 10 years ago, plug it in and carry a bunch of cords with me when I traveled, but they're pretty lightweight. So I'm using a Bluetooth Wacom tablet. Um, and then again, obviously I don't have to know how to use Photoshop at all. I'm just using this so that if I was by myself in my you know, studio, I'd probably use pen on paper. Um, so actually, you know what, let me go to full screen here and zoom in. Again, if you can't see my screen, definitely speak up and let me know. But looking at this top image here, what happens is, um, and you've probably all been here before where you create a figure and it looks cluttered and your colleagues also say it's cluttered and you don't know why. 
the first thing I would do is look at the order of events in which you're showing information. So this is great that you this this individual has added numbers. So one, two, three, and four. Um, however, the order in which I'm reading, I'm going to follow the numbers as well as the arrows. So coming up here, I see a number one. And this is if I had an eye tracker and I'm following around my page. But then there's also this arrow coming up here. So what's that about? That's kind of distracting me. And then I kind of want to go this way, but you're telling me to come back down here because number two is here. And then that's not number three. Number three is up here. And then there's these big arrows that are telling me to look this way. Um, but I know I just went to three, so I'm looking for four now. And I might get distracted by this arrow going across. And OK, there is number four. And then there's a bunch of sort of smaller arrows happening in here. So you can see that this sort of shape does not follow any of the simple compositions to follow rule down here. So if I were to re, um, sort of redesign this figure, how would I go about it? So I think a nice way to do this, if there's some sort of cyclical flow happening, um, always want to start from the top left and then end somewhere here or even back to the top left if it's cyclical. So starting up here, it looks like there's probably some sort of vessel system. There's uh, cells flowing through. Let's see here. If you wanna get really fancy, I would even not have the blood flow coming down this way. I would actually come up and go this way, since again, that follows our general rule of cyclical or left to right. Um, number one looks like it was some sort of uh, I guess, anatomy of a lot of things, a lot of times that happens where you're trying to orient your viewer and bring them into your story by giving them a little bit of a background. And that requires, you know, if you're zooming into a heart, for example, you show the heart and then you zoom in, you show a vessel and you zoom in and you show, you know, the, the tissue level or even the biochemistry happening at that level. So the anatomy of sometimes happens up here. Maybe this is our number one. We do a little blowout of, of what this specific uh, cell is doing. This is, um, in this case, a CAR T cell, a little bit of DNA, that's great. Really, really messy. You should be ashamed of how messy your sketch is. Ignore color, all those details, just general flow. So that's number one. We're still following our rule here. And then it looks like number two is something about trafficking. So we probably want something with trafficking here. Um, and then maybe a number two. And I think it still follows the cell kind of leaves. And let's see, number three is here. We could probably stick the tumor on this right side. Um, and the general flow, this is, oops, that's really big. This is probably the general flow. I wanna take this. And think of it as sort of inertia or gravitational pull where if somebody looks at your figure, they should be able to get the gist of the story. Maybe you use oversized arrows. Maybe you use, um, you know, the sort of cyclical composition. One, two, three, and I think four can be down here. And then there's sort of a cancer cell and the T cell interacting, right? Some spikes, maybe some proteins on it. So it looks pretty good. I think generally this will work. There's a couple of other side stories happening where maybe there's um, something like um, something is inhibiting this CAR T cell or immunosuppressing it. So that's interesting too. So I think this generally works well. So in this case, I think I've got it. Now I've got to trans transfer this into my rendering software, whatever it is. Um, some of you may use Inkscape, some of you may use um, Illustrator if you're expert enough. I just copied it to my clipboard here. I screenshotted this figure and I'm going to move into BioRender. And so here's my before figure. And I'm going to come back here for just a second. Okay. Great. So what I'm going to do is paste it into this blank area. And again, this is environment specifically, but I like to use it as sort of a guide 
or a bit of a cheat sheet or a reference. Um, and specifically in Byronic, you can actually stick it off to the side in the gray area so it won't interfere with your composition. This is your blank sheet of paper to work with. Um, the gray area is just uh, your workspace or your sandbox. It won't actually even export when you export this figure. So that's my image. Um, you know what, for the sake of TV magic, I actually have some of it pre-created. So I'm going to use one that I've already sort of started for the sake of time. And so here it is. You can see here that what I did was basically rotated everything from this figure to this figure. Okay, so hopefully you're still following me here. And what I'm missing here is these big arrows. I'm gonna include some nice large arrows. And that's another thing too, don't be afraid to vary the size of your arrows. If you're making a flow diagram, it's really nice for your viewer's eye to commit to and visualize your story with large arrows. And then that is, you know, agnostic of language as well, because I think arrows are pretty, uh, they translate pretty well uh, across different, um, you know, languages. You don't have to speak English to know that this is something's happening here. You can also think of it as a major highway. So if your information is flowing, there's generally going to be you know, a natural pull and kind of think of it that way too. When you're creating, um, you know, curves and motion, try to follow a natural curve. So for example, try not to do this where information, if it's flowing this way, it wouldn't naturally bevel up like that. It would actually more flow this way. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then, so I've committed to those being the main, I guess, um, story arc you can call it. And then maybe you have these smaller ones inside that it's still important, but you don't want it to be the thing that people will see when they first see your figure. So I'm going to create these smaller little inhib inhibition lines like so. Um, I think I need another one that is related to these chemicals. That's looking okay. So you kind of have this main story and then side stories, but you always want to focus on that main story. So looking at the sketch, I'm, I'm following pretty closely. Um, numbering your figure is always a good idea, but numbering it correctly is another thing. So what I like to use is this sort of, um, it's kind of like a circle with, with a number in it. So that's number one. Um, and then in BioRender, it's actually in this little insert shape where there's these little pill-shaped proteins. There's also these little circles with numbers in it. And maybe I'll even make that font a little bit larger so you can see. There we go. So this is, say, I'm committing to be, you know, step one. I can kind of nudge things around to fit better, but that's number one. Uh, I'm going to Alt-Drag and make number two up here. And type in trafficking. Okay, so already looking cleaner. Um, number three, we can kind of, we can kind of hack it a little bit. It's not gonna be perfectly along the arch, but we're definitely doing better as far as, you know, placement of these objects. Okay, and then number four, I believe is down here, which works well because again, it's sort of a cyclical composition that we've committed to. So already much, much cleaner. Um, let's see here, maybe I'll even take it a step further and just fill in this little tissue area. There we go. Um, let's see, make it maybe a brownish color. We have these beautiful presets as well. So if um, you want to create an organic shape, you can actually do that in BioRender. See. Sorry, I think Zoom is freezing my, my monitor here. So I'm just going to continue. So looking much better. Let's compare the before and after. So here's the before. And here's the after. Sort of a much cleaner composition. Um, I guess what you could do is obviously reshape this tumor if you want. That's also a nice thing about um, bio renders that these are all sort of editable. But you get the idea. 
There we go. And if you compare it to our sketch, still follows that same sort of general flow of information. Okay, so that's composition. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna jump to my gallery and I'm gonna pause here for a minute, see if there's anything. Let's see. Um, okay, doing okay. And by the way, the tablet, I think I bought this on Staples website. That's a Canadian company. I think you guys have other um, like Office Depot type stores, um, wherever you are, maybe you're in the US or Canada. Um, hope that answers your question. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon too. So second sort of concept here is color. And I won't spend too much time, but I wanted to just highlight a couple of uh, common themes that are very important when you're thinking about color. And they are association created by color, temperature of color, and contrast. There's probably a million topics I could have covered on color. Um, but just thinking about you know, repeating elements on your figure, sometimes you don't realize it, but you're creating associations by making similar objects the same color. So for example, if this B cell was colored a little bit more red or maybe even red um, because you wanted to show that it was um, you know, activated or something like that, just be careful about what other elements on your page are similar in color and shape because without knowing it, you're going to create association or draw associations with other objects. Um, even something as simple as, you know, these three purple cells, I think our brains would have associated those as maybe somewhat being related or more related than the other cells. I know it's a very simple concept, but we do see it quite a bit where colors will be used haphazardly or selected haphazardly. So just be careful about your color choices because you will naturally unknowingly make associations by making color uh, sort of combinations the same. Um, same thing goes with shape. Now, if I had sort of these uh, phosphate um, circles, red, you know, at a distance, this happens a lot where sometimes, you know, shapes that are similar, for example, these little um, antigens or um, molecules, those look similar to the phosphate. and for some reason, you know, we, we end up using a lot of circles and squares in, in pathway diagrams. Just be careful that you're using colors, again, that are very different from those if the shape is the same. So for the phosphate, for example, make sure it's like a bright yellow or something, something very different from other shapes on the canvas. Um, same thing goes for, you know, pill-shaped pathway uh, items like this. Make sure those are different enough in color because Again, if they're the same, you will make those associations in your head. Um, one thing I wanted to note as well, uh, your eye is gonna go to the areas with the highest saturation and highest contrast. So in this sort of flow diagram, I'm sure you've had to make one of these before, areas of your image that are um, high contrast, so you know, really, really darks with really, really lights, um, or highest saturation, so the brightest reds, for example, that's where your eye is going to go first. So if this was a bright red like this, you know, my eye is going to go right there. And it's also telling me that is the most important part of my figure. Um, in fact, I could do the same up here. It's very powerful, the use of color. If I were to sort of subdue these to a pastel, your eye went right to the top left of the figure, I bet. Um, and not only that, it's going to emphasize the area that you want people to focus on. So labeling areas with the highest concentration of color is going to get your viewer's eye to look there first and also maybe linger around there for longer. Um, the problem happens when we start to color in things a little too brightly all over the place. Then we're kind of like confused bees around colorful flowers. We don't know which image is the most important which to focus on. So you can see here, once we start getting the sort of rainbow effect, um, the use of color becomes sort of a, a, a moot effort because we've used too many colors. So be very selective about where you're putting color and assume that everything can probably go knock back to grayscale unless it's important. Now, this is an extreme example, but I just wanted to show that um, don't use sort of color willy nilly everywhere. Make sure you're using it uh, very strategically in the right places. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good example of using color associations in the right way. So in this figure, everything sort of, I don't want to say dumbed down, but subdued to sort of a gray palette. And the color, the only color that really pops is this sort of modified cancer cell or this bright green, if you can, if you can see green on the screen. And it's sort of, um, you know, repeated throughout. So the pill colors are sort of subdued. The font colors are subdued. Um, even the sort of mouse anatomy here, it's been lowered in opacity. If it was higher concentration like this, the greens would not stand out as much. So we've actually knocked back even the background of the mouse so that the green really stands out. And then at a distance, everything is easy to make an association from one, two, three, four, five, six, because that green sort of pops at every step. Okay. So use color sparingly, I guess, is the take home message in those cases. Um, and then thinking about scientific concepts, you know, we're trying to make the world a better place. And sometimes that means showing the before and the after, no matter what you're doing. Um, there's usually sort of a, a pathology and then the pathology is fixed or vice versa. You're showing, you know, disease progression, but there's usually sort of um, a comparison and so what you don't want to do is have your user strain to look at what the difference is between the before and after, because that will also make your uh, work look less impactful. You want to make those differences really, really obvious. So don't make it a spot the difference game. Make it a very obvious what is the before and after. So again, thinking about color, um, let's see, maybe we could even make the before a very soft pale um, pink or something like that. And the after, maybe a soft pale blue. Do be careful though with colored backgrounds. It's, it's very um, easy to get carried away and then have everything sort of lose contrast. So there's a little bit of a subtle pop there. Um, I would do something more extreme like making sure that there's a big X on areas that um, you know are turned off or uh, inhibited. I guess in this case, it needs to be an arrow instead of an inhibitor line. There we go. Um, if the focus area is a degradation of this YKI protein, maybe going back to the other um, tip here is that the rest of the elements of your page need to be a little more subdued in color. You know, you can make it obviously um, as colorful as you'd like, but Right away, now I'm seeing the areas of focus are the brightest and most colorful parts of my story. So maybe even these have to be, um, you know, a darker color, a stronger color maybe. So just think about that when you're kind of going through and um, creating your figure. Now my eye goes right to the YKI proteins, if you didn't notice that difference there. Okay, so... Um, your audience is going to be very impatient and um, you want to capture their attention in the first few seconds of seeing your figure. And that's accomplished by hopefully using color sparingly and really trying to get your eye, your viewer's eye to go to the highest concentration and the highest contrast areas of your figure. Um, and then a couple of last takeaways here with color. We think about color temperature as it applies to, again, who's the good character of your story and who's the bad character or the hero versus the villain. Um, and it might feel silly to think of science in this, in this sense, but it really does make a difference. Um, even just sort of drawing that sympathy you want for people for, you know, the white blood cells versus the cancer cell, you know, they want to beat the evil cancer cell. Um, the cancer cell should be a, a bright color because you want to show that it's sort of activated and glowing. Usually, if you if you use desaturated colors, it'll look in inactivated or apoptosing or dead. So that's also a color you don't want to um, go towards is desaturation, unless it is that you're showing you know deactivation. So let's make the cancer cells or the bad guys or the antagonists of the story a warmer color. So warm colors for villains, and then cooler colors are for sort of the heroes of the story or um, the protagonists. There we go. So immediately, it just tells a better story and it, you know, kind of tells your viewer whose side they should be on. 
So very, very simple rule of thumb. Um, and then finally, thinking about color contrast, this is probably the number one mistake I see in figures is a lack of contrast. And that's bad for many reasons. It's um, sometimes not legible. Uh, sometimes figures end up being printed in black and white. And then that's when you really lose information because color sort of is uh, deceiving. Uh, and then colorblind folks, you know, I think one in 12 men are colorblind, maybe even more. Um, I think one in every 200 women. So that's, that's a pretty big stat. And so you really want to make sure you're communicating to a, as broad an audience as possible. Um, a common thing that I see is overlaying objects on other objects. You want to make sure that it's light on dark or dark on light. And here's what I mean by color being deceiving. So I want to change these to yellow. Looks pretty good in color <clears throat> for those that can see color. Um, what we do in, I guess, internally and in the medical illustration world is we actually sometimes convert our figure to black and white. Actually, a lot of painters and artists do this too. They take a picture and then they wash out all the color, say on their iPhone or whatever, to black and white to see where are their color value issues happening. So if you ask any good artist, representational artist, they'll do this. So we actually have a button in BioRender called View Canvas and Grayscale. This will knock out all the color and then you can start to see your figure in black and white. Very important to look at where areas, trouble areas of contrast exist. So those yellow cells are completely obliterated now. You can barely see it in the liquid. So what I would do is go back to a great um, color, color world and change this to a color that is not only darker, maybe brighter. If you want a yellowish color, maybe you do go with if it's important to go with a yellow, but then make sure the test tube is maybe a darker color, or you can lower the opacity of the of the test tube, like so. Either way, you want to play push and play the contrast of your background and foreground elements. So let's see this in black and white. It's a little better now. You see the yellow is popped out. Another common mistake I see is overlaying stuff on cell nuclei. Nuclei are, are typically very dark staining. So um, the color for DNA, for example, tends to be difficult to um, choose colors for. So same example, if I were to use like a green, you know, barely visible, but I guess in color, it doesn't look that bad. But if I were to go to black and white, you can see it almost looks like a single stranded DNA there. So just um, rule of thumb here, Try to convert your image to black and white, maybe before you export, before you throw it into your presentation, just to give a bit of a gut check on um, how much contrast you have in your figure and then adjust accordingly. All right, doing okay for time. And uh, let's see here, great questions. I'll try to address those at the end. Oh, I'm still in black and white mode, I think. Let me turn that off. So arrows and lines. Um, just wanted to go through a couple of examples of, <clears throat> excuse me, how to use arrows and lines properly. Um, feedback loop, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Sorry, excuse me. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So using a sort of circular arrow for feedback loops, or cyclical pathways. There's this neat function here in BioRender we have. You can kind of snip it and then give these a different arrowhead. So this is activation. Oops, activation. Inhibition has its own arrowhead too. There we go. So that's pretty straightforward. I don't have to really spend too much time on that. Um, I guess you want to take it a step further. You know, if the activation is causing something negative in the body, maybe you want it to be red. And then inhibition, if that's suppressing something bad, then you can make it sort of a cooler color going with a sort of um, antagonist protagonist concepts. There we go. Um, labels, if anything, if, if you walk away with anything on this topic of arrows and lines, it's just how to label things properly. And um, a lot of the times the temptation is to sort of just do this. I think you know many of you have probably done this, just take an arrow and point at the thing that you're labeling. And um, 
The problem with this is that a lot of the times arrows are reserved for motion or movement from A to B. And when you label your objects with arrows, it almost looks like either the word's going to move or something is happening that's an action and you don't want to instill that uh, concept or communicate movement when you're trying to label. So in the medical illustration world, if you open an anatomy book, this is very common as well. We use a line with a little dot at the end and that's what this little um, notation is. So if I change that to this dot, you'll see that it turned into this little dot. Um, and we take it a step further by adding this little elbow so that the line is parallel to the word. So we're not sort of doing this, just looks a little less professional when you're, it's not aligned. And this little elbow also helps with um, labeling things that are kind of way out far. It's really nice. You can kind of be flexible and choose where you want to land that line because the first path is sort of anchored to the word. So you can kind of move the end or the tip of it anywhere you like. So that's how you would properly label a diagram. Now this is very handy when you start to get a really complex object that you need to label. Okay, um, dotted lines have a very specific purpose, a time and place, and that is, um, you know, cut lines. So if you've ever seen coupons or maybe a surgical textbook where there's um, an incision line, cut lines are denoted with this, you know, sort of dotted line. Now you can, you know, revise that line to be uh, more spaced out or closer together, but, um, not much more to say there. Also, um, dotted lines tend to show sort of past or future states. So if something has not happened yet or it has happened, sometimes we use dotted lines to show um, movement that will happen later or maybe a weaker signal as opposed to a uh, stronger signal. You know, if this was solid, it would probably show a bit more uh, of a stronger movement like so. So dotted lines definitely have uh, different use cases. On the topic of contrast, actually, I'm gonna make this line white so that it stands out. There we go. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, and I also just wanted to show that the size of an arrow can also determine strength, concentration, um, volume, is that right? Portal vein goes up. So for this, you know, if I make this arrow large and I usually kind of adjust the arrowhead size, don't ever leave it to the default of an app to tell you what the arrowhead size should be. Always adjust it a little bit. Um, and then maybe I'll make this a blue and make this a green. And literally without saying a single word, I've already communicated to you that bile by volume is um, lower, obviously, than portal vein blood coming up. Um, there we go. And even the strength maybe. Okay. Transcription, pretty straightforward. It needs to be a perfect 90 degree angle. So for those that work in this field, um, we do have a perfect 90 degree angle arrow and bio render, but I think you know many apps have this, just make sure it's a clean 90 degree angle. Um, and then, Obviously the arrowhead should be flat if it's an inhibitor line, like so. Already went through movement. I think this is the one place that you can use the pointed head arrow. Um, and I love this arrow in Byrunder because it's nice and swervy. You can actually make it pretty uh, customized. It's nice and flexible. Okay, so that was arrows and lines. Not much else to say there, but just that um, the right use case. Um, different use cases demand different types of arrows and lines. So avoid using arrows to label things if necessary, if, if possible. Okay, so I know we've only got a couple minutes left here. I know we have this room till one. So maybe we'll try to go through the last tip here in just a few minutes. Um, so decluttering your figure, you know, you have to really think about um, what is old and what is new that you're showing. 
Um, a lot of the times there is sort of uh, background information that you want to share, but sometimes that overtakes the novelty of what you're doing and your research um, or your talk. And basically what you want to do is sort of look at what is novel about what you're doing and highlight that as much as possible, because sometimes the background information is sort of too much information for your specific audience anyway. Here's an example. So showing sort of normal anatomy versus um, pathology or maybe changes to anatomy. In this example, um, you know, we've got the lungs and uh, sort of the trachea and the bronchi. What I would do is actually knock back the lungs because once you're here, I think most people know what lungs are. Again, depends on your audience. Maybe you want to orient your viewer. Let's see, human. Maybe you want to orient your viewer if they are, um, you know, a patient. If you're, if if it's for patient education, maybe you're going to want to show um, one of the images with sort of a background of a human body. But this is all dependent on your um, audience level. So sometimes you'll want to show, let's see here, move this to the back, send to back, probably crop more of the body here. Again, not necessary always. And, you know, I'd probably change my canvas size so I don't cut the head off. This is if it's necessary. And, you know, you don't have to repeat the body over and over. I would usually just do it once. <clears throat> And make sure it's obviously to size. I'm not going to do it perfectly now for, for demo purposes. Um, but yeah, sometimes you'll want to show context, sort of that anatomy of, you know, that first stage. Sometimes you do need to set the stage here. I'm going to stretch the canvas out a little bit. That's also what I love about Virender is that you can actually fine tune your canvas size instead of having to move everything around. All right, so we've got that. Let's knock back the background image a little bit. And then let's also knock back the lungs because by now your audience or viewer, they've come to your figure, they kind of know what's going on. They just really want to know what are you focusing on? So knock back the lungs. So now the tumors are starting to like, you know, show through. Maybe we'll even knock back the trachea, the bronchi, the inner anatomy a little bit, opacity. Opacity slider is going to be your best friend when working with layers. There we go. And you'll be surprised how much you can push and pull. Obviously, I would check contrast checker here, turn it to black and white to see, make sure it's still visible. Um, and then even the liver, I'll do the same thing for that. There we go. So the before and the after is pretty stark here as far as what is new and what is old. Old as in what is background information. Um, I'd say the lungs didn't have to be that strong. And now what I'm seeing is the tumor really, it's really striking. That's the area of um, the figure that I'm really concentrated on now. And then finally, you know, looking at alignment and spacing and cluttered figures, decluttering them. Um, don't be afraid to create hierarchy in your text. So if you have a title, make that nice and large. You'd be surprised how big you can get away with. So there's the title. Um, I'd always make it consistent as far as where you're putting your words relative to your pictures. There we go. So in this case, I'm going to try to align all the words to be in the same row. Actually, I'm going to use this align feature. So I'm going to align it so that it's all in the same plane. There we go. Or maybe it should be aligned to the tops. So this one here. Oh. There we go. Align. Top of it. Oh, I guess it is already. Okay. Same thing with these three bottom text boxes. One, two, three. So I'm actually just shift clicking so that I'm selecting them all and do the same thing. There we go. Those are aligned. I'd even sometimes put down some guidelines. So you can see here, I'm up in the rulers and I click. Now many apps have this. I think PowerPoint has this, Adobe Illustrator. 
if you set some guidelines, you can actually just follow those and make sure that all of your text sort of nestles along that line. That's also pretty helpful. So you see this um, object is outside of the line here. Also looking at, you know, what's old, what's new. I think people understand what an incubator looks like. Send this to the back. There we go. Same with this, you know, mount or microscope slide and this microscope. I think we're usually afraid of negative space because you want, we have a temptation to fill every gap, every uh, white area of a canvas, but it's really nice to have, you know, open space around a figure. Now, I think this growth cone is the most important part of this figure. So I'm actually going to exaggerate that shape. So now, you know, that part of the figure really stands out. Um, and then last but not least, we've already talked about this many times is numbering your figure. So, you know, make sure that you have consistent numbering system all throughout. I'm just shift selecting. This is great because I have to do is double click and then number the rest of my figure. So hopefully these tips were helpful. I know we kind of covered quite a bit. Um, I'm also seeing some questions about access to buyer under. Yes, we do have institutional licensing. Many, many schools now, I believe, have um, institutional access to buyer under, at least in the United States. If you're um, dialing in from the United States, we probably have a license if you're at one of um, the major universities. And um, also work with quite a few folks in Europe and Asia. All right, there we go. Much, much cleaner. And these guidelines, of course, you can remove. Let's see, hide. There we go. And it kind of looks like a grid, but you know, without showing a grid, just because we had those guidelines there to guide us. Okay, so I think the countdown is on now. They'll kick us out in about five minutes. Um, but I think I'll pause there. I'll look at some of the questions in the chat. Happy to go through any of um, the questions or topics that I covered. Um, if you would like to try a buyer under, please go ahead and use this free link. Um, it's basically buyerunder.com and then there is a sign up button once you get to that page. And um, like I said, it's free forever until you'd like to subscribe and access some of our premium features. And uh, let's see here. Any questions in the chat? Hopefully this was helpful. Um, anything you would have liked to see, please also add that to the Q&A. Would love to hear your thoughts. Looks like we're doing okay. Great. A couple of things too. Um, if you want to really dig into the world of color, there's this really neat website called um, color.adobe.com. And it shows you sort of, you know, um, images broken down into its core color palettes. Um, I really like using this sort of complementary complementary color slider. It shows you how to combine purples and yellows, red and greens. Although we steer away from red and green for colorblind folks, and then blue and yellow. I say blue and yellow is a very common color combination for showing sort of antagonistic um, concepts in science. But pretty neat little tool there. Um, and then specifically for BioRender, if you do want to learn how to use BioRender, because obviously today was not necessarily a tutorial on BioRender, we have a learning hub called learn.biorender.com. And um, you can sort of learn how to do certain things like create, a draw a mitochondria. That can be pretty complicated. So we go through how to do that in a, in a minute or two tutorial using circle crop to save space in your figure. Sometimes that's a nice way to zoom into an element on your canvas and crop it into a circle. Different ways to align objects, um, how to use dash lines versus dotted lines, things like that. So go ahead and check out learn.biorunner.com and it'll go through some of those tutorials. All right. Great. I guess we have a couple more minutes. So those that want to hang out, maybe I will show a couple of features of BioRender. If not, thank you so much for joining. I hope this was helpful. Um, 
let's see here. Yeah, buy a render templates, really nice way to add images to your figure without having to draw or design. <clears throat> so if I type in protocol, maybe I'll throw in this pre-made protocol template. There we go. So I like elements of this, but maybe this is not exactly my science. So I'm gonna go in, <clears throat> delete it. Maybe this is the wrong virus actually. So I'll delete that, I'll type in um, COVID, maybe it's this one. That works. There we go. So just make the figure your own, even though you use, you know, a template in buyer under, it might be easier to go in and edit instead of starting from scratch. So that's one way to do things. Um, if you want a little bit more three dimension in your figure, we have this really neat PDB plugin for those that work with the protein data bank. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna type in an alphanumeric, which is, you can grab that from the PDB database. Um, let's see here. So it's a little bit easier to use than say PyMole. Um, you can color it nice and pretty. Let's see here, by molecule, by chain. And then you can change it to this neat tune shader, which is pretty popular these days. There we go. And then if I save as a new icon, I've just created a custom icon in BioRender and I can add that to my figure. So that's if you need that level of um, dimensionality. Some, some of you may not. Some of you may just need a simple antibody. And another thing I wanted to highlight for those that work with animal models, we have a huge library of beautiful animal models. <clears throat> Things like, let's see, I mean, if you shout it out, I can look it up. Mouse, all kinds of mice, zebrafish. in different stages of development. Really beautifully rendered and it is vector-based. So no matter how far you zoom in, you're not gonna see a single pixel, which is great. Okay, so I think we are gonna kick, get kicked out. So I will pause there and say thank you again for joining us. Um, hopefully you'll give it a try, give Byron a try and, and let us know your thoughts. We also run how-to webinars as well of our own. So, um, you know, how to make better grant figures, better publication figures, better presentation decks. Um, look out for um, sessions on that. If you go to, I think, webinars on our website, we usually locate it, we usually post it there. Um, actually this Wednesday, we've got a how to use BioRenders. If you wanna join us there, we'd be happy to have you. Great. All right, so we'll sign off here. Thank you so much for joining and enjoy the rest of the conference.